The more you study the history of castles, the more unusual it is to find a king, a knight, or a nobleman who died of natural causes. In fact, when it did happen, it was worthy of mention. Death was a frequent visitor to the medieval castle in the form of famine, disease, or human violence. But in an age that was noted for its violent loss of life, there were some deaths that were outstanding in their cruelty. Barclay Castle in the beautiful rolling hills of Gloucestershire holds the secret to one of the most horrific deaths ever recorded. In this program, we explore murder most foul. To this day, people have reported a cold chill attached to the rooms in Berkeley Castle, for this is where King Edward II met a most gruesome end. Sometimes if, when everybody's gone at night and you stand in the courtyard there and you look at the walls and think, if only you could talk. We had this teenager, and he really was a really macho young chap, you know. He wasn't the sort that was going to be bothered by anything. And uh, he just went horrible grey colour, and he fled out of here. And sort of, he actually went right down the steps, and I went down, and I said, are you all right? So there were voices in there. I didn't like that at all, and he wouldn't come back in again. He, you know, he just went. When we go around locking up at night, you know, because we have to go around it, sort of make sure everything lights are off and things locked up. If I'm left here on my own, I'm not very happy. I'm always glad when I can get out into the courtyard again. Edward II was born within the walls of Carnarvon Castle and was the first member of the royal family to enjoy the title Prince of Wales. His father, Edward I, had conquered the whole of Wales and now presented his son to the people of that country. Now, Edward I had high hopes for his son. But by comparison with his father, Edward was a weak and petulant child. And when he succeeded to the throne, he was ill-prepared. Like many members of the royal line, a marriage was arranged for him, not to suit the desires of his heart, but in the interests of national security and foreign policy. So he was betrothed to a 12-year-old princess, Isabella, daughter of the King of France. In that way, England and France might remain at peace. The two were married at Boulogne in January 1308. Despite his marriage vows, it soon became obvious to courtiers that Edward's true affections lay elsewhere. There was a man, a Gascon by birth, called Piers Garveston. Brilliant in tournaments, he combined unparalleled martial skill with a ready wit and a waspish tongue. A fatal combination, said some. Edward and he were the best of friends and had been for many years. They thought of each other as brothers. Some suggested that they were more than that. Passageways, corridors, and baronial halls, it was whispered that Edward preferred to share his bed with peers than with his lovely young bride. Edward II was a popular change from his harsh father. Tall, fair of face, strong in body, he was fond of tournaments, of jousting, and in the court he possessed a fine voice and an ear for music and verse. So much so that he could compose memorable poems of his own. <laughs> Some 
Suddenly the 24-year-old boy was a man, a king no less. I may do as I please, he must have thought. After all, I am the boss. So it was that, with the taste of power, a novel and highly satisfactory one, Edward thought fit to do those things his father had always denied him. On Isabella, he bestowed one or two estates of his back in France, but on his darling Piers Garveston, he would heap favour upon favour, castle upon castle. Yet Garveston was probably never as conniving as his rivals made out, nor quite as innocent as Edward believed. Edward made him Earl of Cornwall, and it installed him in the romantic cliff-top castle of Tintagel, a place endued even then with a sense of romance, of holy mystery. Within months of taking office, Edward and Piers Garveston succeeded in making enemies more successfully than ever they made friends. Who was this upstart to dole out honours to noble lords? Who was this jackanapes to hold blank charters and seals to instruct the nobility of England as he saw fit? As if to rub insult into injury, the gallant Piers Garveston excelled in the favourite sport of the time, the tournament. He and his men routed the rival teams of the Earls of Hereford and Arundel. Chivalrous the age might have been, but losing, even in sport, is never pleasant. As the Earl of Warwick lay panting on the ground, Gaveston called him the Black Dog of Arden. Warwick swore revenge, and he had plenty of allies. Incensed by this foppish upstart, this waspish man who insulted them and doubtless had plenty of epithets, spiteful epithets, for his other rivals. The jealous barons plotted the downfall of Gaveston. They accused him of crimes against king and country. Edward was powerless to protect his friend and lover. Gaveston was besieged at his castle in Nersborough. Seeing no way out and separated from his beloved Edward, he agreed to a term of imprisonment. He was brought south and rested the night in a village. Meanwhile, the Earl of Warwick, the man Piers had insulted to his face, learnt of his fate. One night, he and his men crept up on that village, overcame Piers' bodyguard, and Garveston was dragged out like a common thief. They say that folk for miles around, hollowed with glee, blew on trumpets as the pitiful figure of Piers was stripped of his status and cast into prison in the castle of Warwick. Scarcely a week had passed before the trial was held and Piers was found guilty. As he was led forth from prison, he knew it was the end. Seeing the Earl of Lancaster, he cried out, Noble Earl, have mercy on me. But the Earl turned to his men. Lift him up, lift him up. For God's sake, let him be taken away. Garveston was taken out of the castle gates to a place called Black Hill. There, he met his fate at the hands of two Welsh mercenaries. One ran him through the body. The other cut off the once proud and now pitiable man's head. Later, Dominican friars sold the head back to the body and returned it 
to the grief-stricken Edward, who had his lover embalmed. He swore vengeance on those who had killed him. The deepest traits of human character seldom change overnight, if ever. Edward never learnt from the loss of his favourite. If anything, he seemed doomed to repeat the experience. For a time, the birth of a son and heir brought him a certain amount of joy, and his wife, Isabella, provided a measure of help and support. But his crippling defeat at Bannockburn at the hands of the Scots, he actually ran away from the battlefield, damaged his standing irreparably in the eyes of the people of England. But more fatal still to his cause was Edward's choice of friends. Even more suspicious, though, was Edward's friendship for Hugh de Spencer, a man whom he made Lord of Caerphilly. Whilst Edward was prepared to neglect his ravishingly beautiful young wife, on Hugh de Spencer he lavished gifts and honours. This man inherited the grand castle of Caerphilly, installing this magnificent banqueting hall in which Edward held court. Isabella had worked tirelessly to help her husband, while he had toyed with his male lovers. At last she could take no more of Edward's feckless behaviour. Her mind was set on revenge. Whilst in France, Isabella had begun an affair with Roger Mortimer. A man no less cunning than many of his peers, and one of the very few who had escaped from the Tower of London, which he did by drugging his jailers. He and Isabella set out to annihilate the feeble Edward. She was now known as the She-Wolf of France. Their plan was to place his young son on the throne as a compliant king. <laughs> In 1326, she invaded England and soon amassed a large force of Edward's disloyal subjects. As Isabella's army advanced, Edward and his lover, Hugh de Spencer, fled north. Eventually, and without too much trouble, they caught up with both Edward and de Spencer. Edward tried to shelter here in Caerphilly. After a while, he slipped out, only to be caught nearby. He was imprisoned. For dispenser, a nasty fate was in store. The Lord of Caerphilly had ruled by fear alone. Now he was dragged through the streets of Hereford, right to the town square. And there, to the sound of trumpets and clarions, he was tied to a 50-foot ladder so that everyone could see him. And then the horror began. In that same place, they made a great fire. And there, his privy members were cut from him because he was a heretic and a sodomite. These were burnt in the fire before his face. And then his heart had to be drawn out of his body and cast into the fire because he was a false traitor of heart. And then his head was struck off and sent to London, and his body was divided into four quarters. Hang drawing and quartering was a political punishment in most cases, because the problem was that if you killed somebody who was a traitor to the king, they could often be seen as a martyr. If you 
kept those bones or body all together, that would give people a point of focus against the king. So what they did was they would cut the body into five pieces. There'd be the four quarters of the body and there'd be the head. To show the people the person who had committed such a crime had died, then the four parts of that body were taken all around the kingdom. Now, in the physical sense, the person was scattered, so there was no focal point. And, of course, with such a punishment, the soul couldn't be at rest because there was no Christian burial, because the body had been split up all over the kingdom. So, both Edward's most notable lovers had met a brutal end. Now the net was closing in on Edward himself. Edward was moved from castle to castle. In the dead of night, he was smuggled out to be transferred to the trusteeship of Thomas, Lord of Barclay. For Edward, the journey to Barclay must have been a miserable occasion. Says one chronicler, Edward was obliged to dress in only the flimsiest garments with no covering for his head. His tormentors would not let him sleep when he was weary. They gave him not what he desired to eat, but what made him ill. They hoped that he would succumb to some illness and die. He was mocked by knights who said, Avaunt, Sir King, and lead on, sire. It seems that Thomas of Berkeley treated his celebrity guest quite well to begin with. But then things changed. It was certainly in Isabella's and Mortimer's interest for Edward to die. They could never rest easy in their beds unless he did. So Edward was brought along this corridor to this room and cast into the dungeon below it. Heavy hints were dropped to his jailers that it would be no sin for him to be killed. Bishop of Hereford, no less, sent an ambiguous message in Latin. Eduardum occidere nolite timere bonum est. Which could mean, do not kill Edward, for it is good to be afraid. Or, do not be afraid to kill Edward, for it is good. With this authority from the bishop, Edward's tormentors proceeded to persecute him. Thomas Barclay made a discreet exit to one of his other estates. Then one of the most brutal, one of the most heinous murders in history was committed. Penned up in his cell, Edward was subjected to the nauseating stench of rotting corpses, tipped into the cellar beside him. It was hoped the contagion from these would kill him, but it did not. And so... One night, the jailers decided to finish him off. There, with cushions heavier than 15 strong men could carry, they held him down, suffocating him. Then they thrust into him a plumber's soldering iron. Heated red hot and guided by a tube inserted into his bowels. Thus, they burnt his innards and vital organs. It's said that Edward's cries could be heard both within and without the castle. For a time at least, Isabella and her lover could have rested secure, safe from any further vengeance from Edward. Isabella of Carnarvon installed her 14-year-old son as king confident that between her and her lover, they could manipulate the boy. But the boy soon grew to man's estate, and finding that his guardians were no more competent at ruling the country than his late father had been, a seed of doubt was planted in his mind. There was a rumour abroad that Mortimer, in effect the boy king's master, was planning to kill all those of royal blood in order to usurp the throne. Isabella and Roger Mortimer were ensconced at Nottingham Castle, where they'd summoned a parliament. Edward seized the moment. 
His trusted protectors found a man who knew his way all around the secret passageways of the castle. They asked him how they might furtively steal into Queen Isabella's chamber. The scout took up some torches and guided the king along a secret underground passage that started some distance away from the castle and ended up in the kitchen and the hall of the main tower. The king's companions charged into the room and seized Mortimer. Isabella is said to have cried, My son, my son, have pity on gentle Mortimer. But there could be no pity for the man who had so cruelly abused the young king's father. The Earl of March, for that was Mortimer's title, was put to death like a common criminal, hanged on the gallows at Tyburn. And what of Isabella? She was as guilty as Mortimer of fomenting civil war in England and murdering her husband. Yet her son spared her life, banishing her from the court. Isabella ended her days in the tranquil setting of Castle Rising in Norfolk. Here she lived, imprisoned and alone, with 30 years to reflect on her past crimes. Towards the end of her life, she joined an order of nuns called the Poor Clares. The once beautiful she-wolf was tamed into a meek, lonely old soul. A few years later, an Italian priest wrote to the young king, telling him that in fact his father had actually escaped from Berkeley, disguised as an attendant. From there, he'd traveled on to several other castles, and then the continent, before ending his days as a hermit at Pavia in Lombardy. Was that just a story to console the young king, or was it the truth? If only these walls could speak. Stay with us on Utah Horizons to meet problem pets who are driving their owners barking mad. That's after the break.